Oh uh, yeah, so this is um our second Zoom session, which is my first Zoom session in English. So uh, this is the outline of our session, the things that we're going to do today. So first, I'm going to have a short recap of the first Zoom session with Amar. And next, we're gonna, um, I will gonna welcome some questions on the um, concepts that are introduced and defined in course materials, um, such as the videos that uh, we, we, we posted, also the social media questions and the papers that um, Amar posted. And lastly, I will talk about the teaching learning cycle. So basically, the teaching learning cycle is the, um, the pedagogical strategy that we will gonna use. We, we will gonna use um, in this entire course. Okay, so uh, so first I let, let's have a recap. So first I talk about the demographics. So in the demographics, we tackled how similar we are and how different we are as well. So. Uh, we are similar because we are, um, most of us are teachers, or if we are not teachers who work in an educational institution, um, directly and indirectly. Uh, we are different because we have, you know, like um, different hobbies, we have different expertise, and we come from different locations in the world. Um, in Amor's presentation, he emphasized that parents and local communities play a significant part in learning of a student. So in this um, course, we we want to we want to focus on engaging engaging um, other stakeholders as well. So it, it's not just about the teachers and, and the students um, working together to, for the students to learn, but also the involvement of local communities and the parents, and also doing projects that uh, that matters to the community. So for example, you know the. Um, the fake news that we that the fake news is one of the exercises that we'll have or major exercise that we'll have before you tackle um like more contextualized issues in your community. So um you know like fake news is a, is educating people about fake news is very relevant and very helpful helpful to the community. So um learning is not just um we advocate that students should not just learn um, learn knowledge, but also use this knowledge for them to be able to create something for their local communities. Because if the, yes, they have a lot of knowledge, like for example, you know, we are, um, most of us are teachers of language. I was a teacher of English before. Okay, I will teach my students to, um, to I, will teach, I will teach my students to speak or write in English. And um, some of them will gonna make it, some of them will not gonna make it. Those students will make it, they're gonna go to, uh, um, elite, to elite universities after they graduate they can go to other countries and land a job in other countries or they're gonna land a um, job in higher position. But how about those students who do not have it? Um, they do not have skills that they can, um, that they can use so what happens is that um, the success becomes individualistic. So uh, if I am good, if I am good in English, then I'm gonna be successful by myself and the others won't be successful. Um, so, so that uh, we do not want to create that kind of stratification in our students, but we want to, instead of like making them successful individually, we want them to create um, to teach them to create something to make the local communities better so they don't have to go to other places just in their community. And if the community is healthy, they are healthy too. Um, yeah. So now uh, let's go to the question. So do you have any question about the video lectures? Um, in the video lectures, I think there's, there's one with Coralie and also the Zoom sessions. Uh, the readings um, Amar uploaded um, is all about subaltern linguistics, incredible research, and positive discourse analysis. And also the six questions. So do you have any questions about this? Um, if you have any questions, you can tell me or you can type it. Yeah. But if you don't have any questions, uh, we can have like um, a little bit of refresh 
uh, refreshment. <laughs> like, yeah. Okay, so uh, do you have any questions? Okay, so... Yeah, uh, uh, yeah I, I have a question. Yeah. When okay, is there you know set the timeline that you know we yes. we can we can discuss this because mm -hmm. uh, that you know we will be discussing them through Facebook you said. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, in case that someone reads, in other words, uh, okay, should you know should raise a question, you know, through Facebook. Uh huh. Yeah. Yes. Is this you yes. know I'm trying to understand. Okay, the process. Yes. Yeah. So, um, because we wanted to be, because some people are, do not, um, use email much. So some of them are more social media. Um, they use social media more so they can post their questions on social media in the, in the group that we have. Uh, we also have WhatsApp group. So we, um, we have different platforms. Uh, we have WhatsApp, we also have Facebook, we also have um, Emodo, and also have email. Uh, we did that because we want to, um, we want to, you know, make it more comfortable to different audience because in some parts of the world, they don't um, really use Facebook, so we can use other platforms in that. So you can ask any question in any, um, using any platform, yeah. Okay, um, um, uh, that would be any time. That would be asynchronous, or not not synchronously. All right, it won't be you know a particular time that we will all get together and ask questions. It will. If I have a question, for example, I can address the question to you or to you or Ahmar, and uh, any time, right? Ah, uh, yes, yes, yeah. Okay. Any time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So now, um, so now we're gonna talk about the key concepts that are, um. I have a question. Oh, sorry. I have, I, have a, I have a question. Okay, sure. Okay. So, uh, there are a uh, few things that I want to know from your side. Number one, mm -hmm. uh, I'm from Pakistan. Uh, how, mm -hmm. that, how the participants can be confirmed that they are participating in sessions and uh, the course organizers have the record how many have missed and how many are participating and uh, number two if uh, due to this COVID-19 situation around the globe if some participant couldn't attend some session mm -hmm. and how he or she can recap with those sessions uh, and number three uh, you have mentioned that you will be sending some follow-up questions I'll be more interested as an educational researcher in Pakistan, working with the communities and working with the uh, schools at grassroots level and mm -hmm. uh, low cost remote community schools. So I should be very much enthusiastic uh, to support those community teachers who are not able to teach the student and grassroots level so situation like uh, in our and under countries uh, there should be some situation solutions that can be provided to the teachers working in peripheries and really in poor and marginalized areas mm -hmm. so these three questions are in my mind if you kindly respond to those i'm very grateful Thank okay. You very much. okay so um so the so your question is about the um so, attendance, recap, and community, uh, you can say needs so, in COVID-19. Yeah, so about the about the recap uh, thing, so all of the sessions that we have, um, it's being it's being recorded. So if they do not have like time now, then they can re um rewatch it, uh, and we upload everything on YouTube. We, yeah, we upload everything in YouTube and also share it in different platforms. So people can revisit it. So if they do not have time. Um, for the, uh, that's, that's very great that, you know, we are also targeting um, those, those people who are really uh, teaching in the grassroots. And it's also, you know, like uh, online education is really a problem, especially in developing countries because technology is very elusive. Um, so what we so uh, as of now, um, 
I the only thing that we can share um, to them now is like for example this teaching learning cycle that it is uh, it is an approach that they can they can use um, they can use not in in their pedagogy but I don't know how will the, how will the government or I don't have any answer like how, what is the ideal thing to do how to mitigate this problem especially we're all in the lockdown so yeah i'm yeah so the the thing that we can only share is the the pedagogy that we know that can really work in grassroots um yeah and later i will talk about that yes so yeah <laughs> okay so now um let's Let's talk about these um, key concepts that are highlighted in, um, in, in the discussions, in the, in the videos, also the, um, also the papers that our sent. So, uh, in the, the definitions of, the definitions of language, um, there are different definitions of language, and if you, if we are studying linguistics. We can see that they have different approaches in studying language, but in this um, in this particular uh, course, we we want um, we define language as a semiogenic system, like what Amr uh, discussed, and he will gonna elaborate it more. So, semiogenic system means it's a meaning making system. So, it's uh because it's only one meaning making system. So, uh, when we it means that there are also other meaning making systems and there are also other ways in um, making meanings in our world so the um, when we are born the how do we connect to our environment so basically we connect our environment through our five senses so in our five senses it receives stimulus or stimuli for example our eyes um, can see colors our eyes can see light our eyes can see text, which is language. Um, our eyes can see, you know, movement. So do, those are stimu stimuli that uh, they can work also work together and they, they create meaning for us. For example, if the light is um, dim and yellow, so we feel, um, so it means that, you know, it, you may, it, it feels like um, relaxed. It's a mood light, just relaxed. But if the light is like um, red uh, and it's changing, the light is changing, maybe you're in a rave party. Or, um, and also, we also, uh, we also have um, sound or hearing. So sound is also a stimulus that we receive and we create meaning from it. So speaking, the sound that you hear from your laptop that's coming from me that's a sound that's a stimulus of sound and and the combination of those sounds create language and then that this language that i'm speaking you create meaning from it and then we can communicate so and we also have um so uh, there are also other stimuli of sound like music or um like how high my pitch is so if my if I speak like this, hi, good afternoon, you know, I'm happy, but if I think hi, good afternoon, you know, so I'm pissed. So you you see the uh, and you also see my expression. So it creates meaning that oh she's angry, oh she is uh she is happy. So those stimulus, um those stimuli uh go together to create meaning. And we also have um also have touch. You know, uh, depending on how people touch you or when when something is hot, like our um, like how tolerant our hand is, and then if it's super hot, of course we remove our hand from from something because it's painful or it's dangerous. And then we also have taste. So of course we have um, and and how whether the taste is good or or bad, how we evaluate the taste or how we make meaning of the taste. It depends on, on of course, our culture and our um, interpretations and interpretive system. So uh, it also has something to do with social semiotics, the, the one I was saying. So social semiotics is basically um, 
is basically a study of how we make meanings in our environment. So how all of these stimuli go together and make meaning. So, uh, and next is about our linguistics. So we know different types of linguistics, like we have psycholinguistics, we have functional linguistics, we have um, forensic linguistics. So one of these um, approaches to linguistics is subaltern linguistics. So basically it's a linguistics that um, uses the study or the knowledge about language um, to create materials or projects that will empower communities. So it basically, um, you know, towards local communities and especially, you know, um, marginalized people or indigenous communities, those communities that have lesser privilege than others. And next is variable approach. So, um, so it's an acronym actually. So it's, a, it's an approach that you can use um, to, to know whether your project is, um, is a project that will actually benefit the community or not. So it's kind of a set of principles or set of guidelines. And you can also use this as an evaluative um, guidelines. And next, positive discourse analysis. So if you ever heard of critical discourse analysis, so basically, um, positive discourse analysis is the opposite of critical discourse analysis. So critical discourse analysis is basically looking at um, discourses and then pointing out problems in those discourses. So for example, um, for example, like there's a there's a discourse and then they look at the tension or oh, in um, oh, in their interaction, the the kids cannot like the kids do not have much linguistic experience to to uh to talk and then the the teacher or the or the other kid is very overpowering so you can see like the tension or um so the so basically critical discourse analysis is looking at the tensions and looking at the problems in the discourse so positive discourse analysis is the other way around so it's looking at um model discourses and looking at the things or looking at the yeah the things that makes it good um so it's basically looking at and finding solutions so for example um you know why uh how how greta thunberg um how greta thunberg influenced the influenced the youth to um, to have a movement to fight climate change. So how did she do that? What's what's in it that in her discourse? Or for example, a teacher who is teaching in an indigenous community on a grassroots, and then it's she's a he or she's a very good teacher. And then look, we can look at how, how what is it in his or her discourse that makes his or her uh, teaching good or working in the community. So that is positive discourse analysis. Okay, so now we will gonna talk about um, the teaching and learning cycle. So teaching and learning cycle, we will talk about uh, what is it, why are we doing it, and how do we do it. Okay, so basically, um, Teaching Learning Cycle, or TLC, is a pedagogical approach based on Levi Gluskitz's social, social cultural theory of learning. So um, when we say social cultural, so it means like how, how the society, or the, yeah, how the society and the elements in the society in our culture um, makes it, um, how they play in the learning of a species. So Levigotsky is it's about human learning, but uh, if you look at it, it doesn't only occur in humans, but it also occurs in other species, and it naturally occurs in the wildlife. So it focuses on how social animals learn in nature. So social animals like um, dolphins, like bear, like um, bees, or like uh, birds. And one of the social animals is 
humans. So humans are social animals. And this uh, basically the theory is capturing how um, species learn in nature. So it is basically an apprenticeship model and it uses scaffolding for learning. So when we say apprenticeship model, apprenticeship model is very common in um, in society in, in indigenous communities. So and in societies that um, created the culture from from grassroots to up. So um, when we say apprenticeship model, it's like there's a master, and then there's a there's a non-master or a student and then the master trains the student to become masters so it means that if you do not have expertise then you cannot teach um which is very uh if you look at it it's very commonsensical like how can we teach somebody to cook if we ourselves cannot cook how can we teach somebody to ride a bike if we ourselves cannot ride a bike? So, so that is an um, apprenticeship model. And we use scaffolding. So uh, I have an open close parenthesis here. It says it's provided by masters, experts, or teachers for learning. So it's not, um, yeah. So because, because the, the experts or the masters or the teachers know what the students need. And it's teacher focused, not student focused. So the teacher is the leader and the evaluator. The teacher is the leader of the ship. Um, so, uh, so what happens is that the teacher is the one who provides. And later, I will gonna, I will gonna show you how does it work first in wildlife, and then next, how does it work in human beings. So. Um, and I will also gonna um, demystify some of the misconception about the teaching learning cycle. So because um, you know when we hear when when people hear, uh, I notice is that when people hear teacher focus or teacher centered, they think of oh the teacher is strict and the teacher doesn't want the students to talk that the students are receiving and then they are like robots and teach. The teachers are like the the military and the, they are strict and they cannot you know and so um it, it's not like that so later i will i will talk about that so why are we doing tlc why tlc so uh so the teaching learning cycle is actually um it's made to destabilize unequal privileges of students uh, that the students bring in the classroom. So it aims to create equal opportunities for learning. So, um, so it means that, uh, so it, this, this um, pedagogy, so it started uh, here, is the theory, Levygotsky's theory, of course it started somewhere, but the, this pedagogy, this framework, um, they designed it here in Australia. Because here in Australia, there are, um, there are indigenous people here. Um, and these indigenous people are very marginalized. So most of them are, um, you know, they, they, have a differ, they have different English or they, have, they don't have English at all. They are, uh, some of them are poor. So when they go to, to class, the white students overpower them. And what happens is that they fail. So, uh, so this framework is made so that everybody will gonna have equal opportunity in the classroom. So whoever you are, whether you are you are a son or a daughter of a CEO of a company versus a, a poor person, a poor kid, and you know even though you have you are coming from different backgrounds. When you go to when you go to the classroom, you are all equal. Okay, so these are the privileged students may or may not have in the classroom. So first is financial. Um, so of course, students who have more money, they can have tutors. So if they cannot, um, if 
if they cannot understand the lesson in the class, they will go back home and they'll have their personal tutors. Why? Because they can afford it. Um, so, so it is not um, it is not much of a of a problem if they have if they have money to pay for the tutor. Um, compared to other students who come to school, sometimes they're hungry, and they are uh, they they are not interested because they're hungry, or they're not interested because they're thinking of their job. They have a night job. They need to work at night because uh, just to meet, just to make their ends meet. Um, next is social. Uh, social. So there are students who have more um, like social capital than others. Like for example, if we are teaching in ter tertiary education, there are some students who come from elite um, high school, some students who come from non-elite high school. And then those students who come from elite high school, they are the, the stars of the class. Oh, they come from elite high school, they shine. Yeah, so they, are, they already have that um, you know, kind of evaluation. Uh, and that is a social capital. So we see that Students bring it to the classroom, bring those stuff to the classroom. Another is cultural. So, um, like uh, uh, in in a certain country, you know, there are like subcultures, and they are there are cultures that are not. Um, there are some like stereotypes in the culture. I like, for example, in. Um, for example, in um, in in Pakistan, the urban the urban people, urban people from Karachi or from uh, Lahore or from um, yeah <laughs> yeah from the urban center, and then what if there is a student who comes from Bahrain, and then the student relocated to to Lahore, and then the student goes to to school and of course they, they have they already have like a stereotype towards oh student comes from the, the mountains yeah so that uh, kind of you know like cultural privilege or non privilege is being brought to the classroom as well and lastly is uh, linguistic so there are people or there are students who can speak and write and use the language that is mainstream so, for example, um, in in the Philippines, uh, the language of the language of um, the Akarin is English and Filipino. So they have mother tongue, but it's on from grade one to grade three. At the end of the day, they still have to learn Filipino, which is Tagalog based. So Tagalog, um, so Tagalog community eh, has already has linguistic capital. So in uh, in that that also works in other um, other countries for example here in Australia if their mother tongue is English versus uh, the immigrants who uh, the, their mother tongue mother tongues are not English or in Pakistan um, Urdu in English are the the languages of of the the Akhadi. and another um, type of linguistic privilege is um, what what Rufi Hassan um, explained in her paper, uh, she said that the that students who have um, parents who work in types of jobs that have that uh, that have decision making, so it means that they, they make decision in their jobs. They are more privilege than those students whom their parents has jobs that take orders. So for example, if a student has, uh, the, the student's parents are like doctors, supervisors, managers, so th they're the ones who decide. So their language, their language are more um, logically complex. So for example, if I do this, then this will, A will happen, uh, B can, it can happen, B can happen, C can happen, 
So what will I gonna do? Okay. Or if I do this, then this may happen. So so the you know the logical complexity, and then they uh they pass it to their kids as compared to those students who have um parents in a that has a job that only take orders. So what they do is like um yes mom, yes sir, hello, good morning, how are you? Yes, no, yes, no. So their their um their discourse, their they receive that kind of discourse from their parents. So uh for example the um security guards or like um you know like baggers in in a grocery store so they don't make decisions they put back they, they they put groceries in the bag and then they say good morning ma'am good morning sir oh, you do this yes ma'am you do this yes sir don't do this okay ma'am okay sir so they only have like the, that binary um binary uh discourse so what happens is that when these students go to school in the classroom and we know that the language of academia the language of classroom is complex so uh, it's complex and it's logically com complex it's full of um logical meanings then the students uh the, the second group of students are marginalized because at home they are not taught or it's not they're not taught but it's the, the the their discourse is only limited the 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 logical meanings are only limited compared to those to students in the first group okay so so that's also another way of how we think of linguistic privilege so now tsc it destabilizes all of those privileges that the students bring inside the classroom. So this is the, uh, this is how we do it. So how we do it is through this um, framework. So we can see here that there are three stages. First stage is deconstruction. Next is joint construction. And the third is independent construction. So we can see uh, here that it is uh, teaching happens in setting context. So it's it's in the context. Teaching happens in the context all the time. So we're gonna teach uh, something that is out of context or out of out of the blue, or we are teaching something about uh, how aliens live in this uh, planet. Um, but we are teaching the here and now. What is here and what is now and what do they need? So deconstruction. Uh, so all of them, you see, they're working, uh, they're, they go and working towards the control of and critical orientation to skills, knowledge, and language. So you see, uh, yeah, so yeah. there's... Can I, can I ask a question? Okay, yeah. So you are, to you are talking about the three stages like deconstruction, joint construction and independent construction mm -hmm. but uh, shouldn't shouldn't it start with building the context or field the first uh, stage i will gonna i will gonna talk about that yeah oh, i'm gonna talk you. about that yes okay. so so you see uh, so the main goal of this is to to um to control and critical orientation to skills knowledge and language so that is the the goal of teaching and learning cycle so the first stage is deconstruction. So when we say um, deconstruction, deconstruction is also modeling. So deconstruction is telling them, setting the context. So so um, teaching the the students the the context and what is it about and modeling it. And through this, we are building the field. So for example, if I am a, a teacher, I'm a teacher of writing. For example, English. Uh, writing and I teach um, I teach students who are um, in media okay, for example in media and then I'm teaching reports okay so of course um, report so there are different uh, there is report in different contexts so there's report in like broadcasting 
broadcasting their reporting. Um, there is also report in Latin, like hard news. You know, hard news is also a report. Um, and then we can also look at how reports work in different contexts, like how does report work in broadcasting? What are the, what are the uh, linguistic characteristics or linguistic features? So in the first, uh, first phase, uh, looking at the first phase, what are the meanings and the, the linguistic features that are there? And then in the second phase, in the third stage, and then we can also look at um, what is report in uh, journalism, hard news, we can look at hard news, or what is report in hard sciences? Okay, so how do they do scientific reports? How do they write scientific reports? How do they um, present their, uh, how do they present their experiment, which is also a report in a conference, or how do they write laboratory reports? So that is reports within the field of science. So we, we will tackle that if they are in sciences, um, if, they're, if they are, yeah, sciences major. Or, yeah, so, so that is um, deconstruction. And then modeling. So modeling is we, we are, you know, presenting them the model text. So for yeah, presenting them the model text and how do experts do it? So this is, a, this is a good test. This is another good text. Okay, so how does it work? What meanings do they, do they, um, do they convey in different fields, etc.? And then next, once we um, once we tackled and once we explained it, we will go to joint construction. So joint construction is basically um, doing it with them. So once we explain, for example, I am teaching um, media students or journalism students about um, report and, and journalism students how to write a report, which is hard news. So, ha, so once I have um, I have explained it, then we will then write together a hard news. Okay. So we will then write it together, all together, uh, with the class. So uh, when when I was uh, studying in Sydney Uni, even though I was a postgraduate, our um, my professor still taught us how to write. And we all, we all wrote it. So the whole class, and then um, of course the teacher is there. And then like, for example, the first class. So, so we're gonna write a um, news, news article. And then the first class, so who will gonna, who will gonna make the, or who will gonna write the first class? And then, and then a student will gonna participate and then we'll write. And then until we, um, and then until we create our own model text, so that's joint construction. So if we see that there are still um, students who who are not like getting it or uh, are still confused, then we can go back to deconstruction. So it's not uh, it's not we can go back to deconstruction and then joint construction again. Then deconstruction we can provide more examples and then we can write all together again. And then once all the students are on the same boat then that's when we're gonna do independent construction. So independent construction is what we call assessment, like major assessment. So it's basically when the students do not, um, do not work with us anymore. Like they can write their own hard news themselves. So you can see there is building field. So this field, so field is um, like ideation and meanings. There are the concepts, the um, like how in, in terms of skills, like how do you really do it? Um, so, so for example, uh, when if there is a person who, who is a hobbyist and he likes, um, he likes watching birds or bird water, so if you ask that person, maybe that person can name like um, 10 species of birds or 20 species of birds or maybe um, 30 species of birds. But compared to a person who is an expert, uh, who is an expert on birds, who is an ornithologist, then that person can 
enumerate more species. That person can maybe enumerate hundreds of species. And not only enumerate, they also know the structure of the, uh, the physical structures of each bird. They also know how do this bird interact with the ecosystem, uh, what is their role in the ecosystem, and then how do they, uh, what is their development, the stages of their development, etc., etc. how do we take care of them. Um, so that is field. So we see that uh, a hobbyist versus an expert, the expert has more, uh, can present like more uh, and, and more complex field, more complex concepts in the field than a person who is an expert. So that is what we are developing here. So we are developing, we are, um, we are creating uh, more, uh, more complexity in the field. That we are building it, building it to our students. So when, when our students are babies, they know what is water. They drink water. They, they may not know that it's called water, but when they grow up, they will know that it's water. But when they... Um, when they are in their secondary school, they will know that it's, it's composed of say, uh, two, two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. And it can also be called H2O. And then when they become, um, well, and then we can expand this, like how does, how, what, what will happen if we put another atom of oxygen in H2O, then it, would, it will become hy uh, hydrogen peroxide, which is not, uh, we cannot drink it we're gonna die because it's a bleaching agent or how does h2o react with salt then we can create brine. so that's you know like in chemistry we can we can expand the field so that's what we are doing here or if, if we are like skill based you know um first we can like make tables and then uh if, if they become experts then they can create houses um yeah so that is yeah so in in simplistic way it's like this the construction is i do it joint construction is we do it and then independent construction is you do it okay i do it we do it you do it um one of the most um common observations that i have is that um when when church teach it's it's only i do it and then you do it the joint construction is mo mostly not present in in the uh, teaching learning teaching learning experience. So uh, when I was studying, I was studying uh, actually. I never experienced writing with my teacher. So my teacher just presents um, presents the text, model the text, and then and then I will then write it. So that's very common. Um, yeah, so that's my undergraduate and my primary school. But in postgraduate, I experienced um, writing with a teacher and that is the first time I learned to write academic papers. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we, let's look at it in terms of wildlife. Before we go to to the stages, um, let's talk about sociosemiotics again. Uh, so you can uh, did you observe that when when the baby baby cub um, was uh, when the baby cub slipped, uh, the the music changed. It's like ding, ding, ding. And then the music changed. Then it at first it was like ten 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 ten, and then after that the music changed and then um so the music is the sound the stimulus and then the image is the stimulus uh the stimulus there's an aspect of our eyesight so the the movement and then the sound work together to create a meaning and what meaning is that is that it's dangerous that the baby cub may die if the baby cub um falls 
falls from the tree. So, so you see how meanings and how these things interact to one another. And that is um, sociosemiotics. So going back to the stages. So first, um, let's talk about the uh, I do it deconstruction. So I, I, um, I had a little bit of research about um, Alaskan black bears. So what they do is that they hibernate during winter. And then uh, it was not shown here. Um, so actually, it's not the first day of winter and then the baby cubs just go down. It's like, okay, it's winter, let's go down. It's not like that. So the, uh, the, the mama bear actually um, goes, goes down and up because the, the mama bear needs to eat um, and regain its strength that was used during its hibernation. And um, so, so the mama bear goes down, goes up, uh, climb, climbs down, climbs up, climbs down, climbs up. And uh, so the, the, the cubs um, see it, that their, their mom just uh, go, climbs down, climbs up. So that is, that is deconstruction as well. Because the, the mom is modeling, um, modeling, climbing down and climbing up. So here you can see that the mommy didn't go all the way down. So the mommy was like in the middle because, um, because we, they, are just, they, they are doing it. So that is, you know, like the modeling. The, the mom climbs down and yeah. And then after that, they, they did joint construction. So like, like what I told you, that the mom didn't go all the way down because she is doing it with her cubs. And the first cub is, you know, he's a natural. He is, um, he can climb down just naturally. And uh, yeah, but before he climbs down, we, we observe that they are first in the branch. So they are like hanging on the branch. So it's not that they, they go out of the, of the tree and then climb down. Uh, it's not like that. So they go out of the tree and then they just, they were just like there on the branch. And then they are like, you know, like gaining their strength and also gaining their confidence to uh, go down. So that is what we call, you know, like scaffolding. Um, scaffolding first, so they are there first, hanging, and then, and then the the first cub was able to go down um, because the first cub that has more confidence and doesn't have much, doesn't need much scaffolding. But the but he he was scaffolded as well, and then the other cub, uh, the second cub. So what? Uh, so the mom needed to provide more scaffolding. So they did it again. So the mom climbed up and then they did it together. So the baby cub was climbing down and then the, the mom was like uh, licking and patting the, the baby cub because that is her um, scaffolding for the baby cub to be able to go down. So that is joint construction. They are doing it together. So it's like, um, it's like you know, the birds. Um, so the birds there in the nest, the baby birds, and then the, the mommy flies, and then the mommy comes back with the worm and then um, feeds the baby. So that is, that is modeling. So the, the babies see the moms fly, and then when they grow up, then the moms, uh, the, the mom will gonna do, uh, they will gonna fly, and the, the mom will gonna do it with them. And then last is the independent construction, which is not shown here. Independent construction only will happen when they become full grown cubs and can climb down the tree without the presence of their mother. So it means it's like, uh, it's around 16 to 18 weeks when they, don't, um, when they don't breastfeed anymore, when they don't feed with their moms anymore. Yeah, so that is um, independent construction. So you see that in the wild, it naturally happens um, in, in human beings as well. Uh, but but be, uh, yeah, 
but of course we have different way of like teaching and we have like different approaches to teaching so how how is how is tsc how does tsc work in humans so for example when we are teaching babies to walk so what happens is that you know um the the babies they are like sitting or they are uh, lying down and then they see their mom and dad or their brothers and sisters they're walk, walking walking around the house is walking and walking and that is modeling we model them how to work uh, walk and then um consciously or subconsciously uh we do that and then when at a certain age then we walk with our babies so, you know we hold our babies and then we walk with them it's like uh, we hold them and then we walk so that is joint construction and then we do that over and over and some people um, use walkers so that is also scaffolding so our um, yeah so our hands our strength is also scaffolding and the baby walker can also be a scaffolding and independent construction happens when they can walk themselves and then after that they're gonna learn new skill they're gonna learn how to they're gonna learn how to run and then after that they're gonna learn how to jump or etc etc and they will develop fully develop their movements um, another is teaching children to read so you know uh, we have we have you know pictures and then we say uh, for example uh, a for apple like this apple apple and then they hear they hear it apple and then and then um, we we teach them we read with them so this is apple apple yeah and then um, after a certain time then they will be able to read by themselves and then um, language teachers in higher education um, teach students to read um, in different fields for example you know uh, a person it doesn't mean that a student knows or can read English or speak English that a person can really read because um, for example uh, if you are reading a highly specialized English for example um, aviation or theoretical physics you know if we ask a student in media or communication or we ask a student in humanities to read um, a journal an academic paper about theoretical physics that even though he it is in english or it is in chinese even though that person knows chinese can read chinese can speak chinese that person will not be able to understand physics because that is not the field that the the student is an expert of so we also need to be aware about the different fields and different genres that uh that we cannot expect a person to know one genre and to know another genre as well so me i cannot read theoretical physics i just cannot read it it's full of mathematics and it blows my mind yeah so um and next um teaching to play uh, musical instruments it's like teaching teaching how to play guitar so in teaching how to play guitar, we do not teach them like, okay, the first, I will teach you the first chord. The first chord is G sharp major seven. It's like, huh? <laughs> yeah, G sharp. It, we need to teach like a chord first that is um, more basic, like C or D. We only need three fingers and then we put our fingers. We show them how to strum, like up, down, up, down. And then, and then after that, um, we will gonna play with them and then we're gonna play with them up down up down and then after that they're gonna be able to play a musical instrument some people take it in a in a more formal way like uh, in conservatories they teach first musical theories oh music theories so if you want to like take it in a uh, in western music theory then they're gonna um they're gonna teach the sol sol fa syllables the do re mi um in in south asia i think uh, there's a different um there's there's a different uh, music theory in south asia 
which is uh, not like the the Western music theory. So we can also do it in that way. So first we model it, and then we play it with them, and then we model it again, play it with them, model it again, play it with them, model it again, play it with them, and then after that, then they can play their own music. Yeah. So that is basically um, yeah. So those are the stages and how TLC works in humans. So um so like what I told you earlier that because it's um you know TLC is teacher centered. So it means that the teacher is the leader or the evaluator. So one of the uh, observations that we have uh, in a classroom is that um, for example, you know, uh, there's a teacher of writing and then the teacher we're gonna ask, okay, um, read, read this text, uh, homework, read this text. And then the day after, the students are gonna come and then the teacher will gonna ask, okay, let's look at the first paragraph. What can you say about the first paragraph? So that is not TLC and that's not serving the purpose of TLC. Why? Because if we ask questions, so in TLC, we cannot expect students to know something without teaching it. So if we ask questions, then we are, um, remember, the students have their privilege. There are students that have tutors. So students that have tutors, they, their tutors advance them. So it means that before they go to your class, they already know something. There are students who do not have tutors. Or, yeah, so there are students who do not have tutors. So if you ask a question without, without, um, without uh, explaining the text to them, then only the students who are advanced will gonna be able to answer. So what will happen to the other students? Other students will gonna be like, oh, I'm stupid, oh, I'm not good, oh, I'm not, you know, and then uh, we will just gonna destroy their confidence. So uh, in TLC, we, we, we model the text, okay, so this is, this is a hard news, and this, this is a hard news in this X newspaper. And this is the first paragraph. So the first paragraph, these are the, um, the linguistic features. Why do they use the linguistic features? It's because it's this, this, it creates this meaning, this meaning, and then look at, look at the second paragraph or look at the third paragraph. Look at how it changes the meaning. The first clause, look at the, uh, look at the actor in the first clause and how, how does it change and look at, um, and then compare it to the first uh, paragraph and this these are the features and blah 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 and this is the reason why they do that why reporters do it or why journalists do it it is because etc etc and then after that that's the um that's the time that's the time when we can ask questions to them so uh you know we can ask okay so class what is hard news again so we are giving the students who are not advanced an opportunity to answer because we taught it. We already said it. And then it happens. It happens. We, uh, it happens all the time. We're going to model and joint construction, deconstruction, joint construction. And then until everybody is on the same boat. So, um, yeah. So... The thing is, you know, remember the cub? So the first cub is an exceptional cub. The second cub needs a lot of scaffolding. Um, the first cub is like our exceptional students. But the thing is, they do not represent the majority of, our, of the students' population. How many first honors do we have in a class? One, because it's first. How many, how many uh, valedictorians do we have in a class? You know, or in a batch? It's not even 
of the population. So most of our students are cub two, the second cub. So we need to be um, we need to be like the mama bear. We are the mama bears of our uh, class or the papa bears. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, another is, you know, uh, it's teacher centered. So, so does it mean that we, we don't allow our students to talk or to speak or to like say something about it? Uh, of course we allow them, but we need to teach them something first so that everybody has an equal opportunity to collaborate. So for example, you know, we, uh, we want to like, like create a group discussion. So we can, um, we can teach like what is hard news and then uh, we, we created hard news with them. And then they can discuss it with themselves, you know, how can uh, they can create um, hard news together, together because we already created it all together as a class. Then after that, they can have like another exercise uh, in small groups and then they can create like hard news together. So everybody can, you know, even the, even the, you know, even the, the, the student who is, who is like uh, most left behind at first, maybe then that student, you know, has an opportunity to um, add a clause or add a sentence or maybe like a word in that. So, so the, the students will be able to see his or her contribution to the text. Um, yeah, and yeah, and and another is uh so this this is this approach is kinda um it's kinda like opposite to what we call discovery learning. So have you have you heard of discovery learning? So um the thing about discovery learning is that it works only for uh for elite schools. So in uh, classes that have smaller number of students, like they only have 20 students, because in discovery learning, we let the students go. Like they learn it themselves. We are just providing them the materials. Okay, here are the materials, and then we make sure that they learn through that materials. So they discover it themselves. Um, but the thing is, like what I told you, that these students, um, these students bring uh, privilege in the classroom. There are students who have tutors, there are students who have money, there are students who have more experience. Um, you know, there are students who have more experience, they, they travel the world, they went to this place, this place, and this, this place, so they have more understanding of the things that you are teaching. Then, then what will happen is that those students who are, who are less privileged, they don't have the capacity to discover because it just doesn't exist in their in the discourse that they are a part of it, they only experience it in school so it only works if you know uh, our classroom is very small and we have a lot of time yeah so so tlc wants to uh destabilize all those um, privileges. So even you're, you're a son or a daughter of a CEO, you are equal to, to a son or a daughter of an indigenous person or a poor person in this classroom. Yeah. So, and also I would like to add that um, so the, most of the examples that I told you are um, mostly uh, um, Western knowledge, like for example, you know, like chemistry, the spe uh, or uh, biology, you know, the species, kingdom, phylum, etc. Um, there are also uh, there are also like other other kinds of language, uh, or other kinds of like knowledge building or taxonomy. So every language has its own field and has its own way of controlling um, knowledge. You know, for example, in uh, we, we know that there are four seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall. But in, um, 
uh, one of the groups in Indigenous Australia, they have eight seasons and they have term in each of it. Um, so there, it is embedded in their, the knowledge is embedded in their language. So uh, whatever, whatever you teach, whether you are teaching the mainstream knowledge uh, or whether you're teaching the non-mainstream language, uh, knowledge, um, it is all captured in language. That is why uh, we, we believe that all subject teachers are language teachers because you cannot do science without language. You cannot do history without language. They're all realized through language. You know, uh, if you're a biology teacher, you know the kingdoms, the kingdom animalia, the kingdom plantae. So what, how are they realized? They're realized through language or mathematical ex equations and expressions. They're realized through language. So as language teachers, we need to um, provide support to the, uh, to the field that, uh, linguistic support so that they can participate in the, in the field. Um, yeah, so for example, if we are teaching major uh, students who are major in science, then we should teach them the genres in science. If we are teaching um, students who are major in um, arts, then we should teach them the, the language of arts or media. Um, if we are teaching high school, then we can be like more generic. Um, and and more basic than specialized. Yeah, so, and lastly, so this course, in this course, these, uh, uh, these are just like uh, um, the, the stuff that we will gonna do later uh, and all throughout. So as participants, our main goal is to create materials or projects that are worthwhile to our communities. So, um, so the one, our advocacy, is to is that education should be should be done in a way that our communities benefit from it not only individuals um so we're not focusing on individual success so the success of and the health of community is also the success and health of us so in this um in this course we will gonna try it and we are using plc so now it's it's only an introduction so on May 6, we will then experience deconstruction. So phase two is deconstruction, phase three is joint construction, and phase four is independent construction. So the phase two and phase three, um, we will gonna work with um, fake news, like creating materials and spotting fake news in your, that is beneficial to your own local communities. Okay, so uh, fake news about um, COVID-19 because this is, you know, this is a relevant issue and this is an issue of each and every community around the world. So, yeah, so this is like the, the text that we're gonna create and we will gonna, um, we, and then we will gonna have a session. Um, uh, how will you analyze other texts using positive discourse analysis? And then once we pointed out all the um, strategies like good strategies oh it worked here it worked here then we can recontextualize it in our own materials so we will gonna have a session where we will um, analyze it with you uh, we will analyze it all together one of the videos of um, Aurelie um, about oh yeah one of, about positive discourse analysis so Aurelie provided a model so um, I, I really recommend that, I strongly, strongly recommend that you um, watch that because that is our modeling. And then after that, we will gonna do joint construction and then we will gonna create something. So uh, in, in phase one, uh, so you can see phase two, phase three, and phase four are all parts of TLC, but in each phase, there is also like sub, uh, sub cycles, okay? So within deconstruction, we will also gonna have deconstruction, deconstruction, joint construction, and um, independent construction. So we will gonna have like, we will, we will use it over and over and over again. Okay, and then uh, we here, uh, 
we will let you experience the teaching learning cycle because we do not believe that um, you can do something if you haven't really experienced it. So if, if I just, um, you know, if we just gonna tell you what is it, uh, I don't know if, if we can really do it in practice. But if we experience to be students, <laughs> then we can teach. We can teach this, um, this pedagogy. Um, and of course, we're not gonna explain it to our students. I'm, I'm explaining it to you so that you know the, the framework that we are using because we are all teachers. And we're all gonna use it in our classrooms. And next, um, we will use the key concepts as framework to create materials and the projects. So the key concepts that I presented to you, like subaltern linguistics, positive discourse analysis, credible approach. So all of those um, we're gonna uh, recur all throughout the course. Yeah, so it's 5.22. Um, so do you have any questions? Questions? Yeah. So I heard, I hope you learned something. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask me. Uh, can I say something, if you can hear me? Yep. Um, it's not a question, but like a general comment. I just want to say that it was a really good presentation and that I learned a lot from this session. Oh, thank you. Um, um, and I'm a teacher in Turkey at a university in higher education. And as I was listening to the talk about discovery learning and how it's sometimes not useful for certain students, mm -hmm. I agree with that completely because... Uh, in our school, for example, in the preparatory school, I teach mm -hmm. English at different levels. And I can see that, for example, for students in the pre-intermediate elementary low levels, they come from a very low socioeconomic background. Yeah. They're, as you said, they're very you know, underprivileged and they don't have equal opportunity uh, to learn and to speak English compared to upper intermediate or advanced learners of English. Mm -hmm. And the way you explain, you know, teacher centered first and, you know, I do it, we do it, you do it, I think really is relevant in my context. Mm -hmm. And as you were, you know, explaining it, I was just thinking about a project that I could do for um, our community as well. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the teachers at our university started YouTube videos uh, for online, you know, education especially for the lower levels because uh, they were very demotivated after the coronavirus situation and they couldn't, you know, study on their own. And many of them don't have internet access or they live in these, you know, remote villages or, um, you know, in a place where they can't really learn on their own. And so, mm -hmm. you know, any kind of extra support I think is necessary. So um, the approach that you mentioned, you know, TLC, I do it, we do it, you do it, I think is very relevant here and very, very beneficial. Thank you for the talk in that way. I just wanted uh, to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, it's also, yeah, it's, it's, it's relevant to me as well because I used to teach um, in the Philippines. I used to teach English mm -hmm. and I used to do discovery learning. And it just doesn't work. It just doesn't yes, work. Yes, 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 <laughs> yeah. exactly. O only, uh, because the, only the top 10 uh -huh. students can do it. Yes. But the rest is like, oh my God. <laughs> exactly. Because um, as you said, you know, when you want a discussion to be made in the classroom, you see that, as you said, one or two students participate the, yeah. and the others are silent, either because they don't know what they're talking about or their level of English is low or they can't say anything because they need more support yeah yeah so thank you for that yes yeah uh hi mora if you can hear me i'm rizwana islam hi hi rizwana hi i'm from bangladesh i'm teaching mm -hmm. in a university uh yeah. so i i wanted to ask two things unfortunately i missed uh the first part of the session uh, i completely forgot that uh, we had a session at 12 uh, totally my fault uh, i was wondering if it's possible to uh, provide us the powerpoint used is used in this session i know the recording will be available but there were a, a bunch of theories which i want to you know 
study yeah. again and uh, the uh, if i can get the powerpoint separately it would be a bit helpful sure. so that was yeah. one uh, question i had Mm -hmm. And another issue which I want to talk about, I wanted to ask you uh, is about the session, today's session actually. Mm -hmm. And there was this uh, idea about teaching learning circle. And of course, I agree with the previous speaker who said that we all do it. We all do this, which, which we actually do. And uh, that's why uh, I was wondering if our final project for this course mm -hmm. will be based on strictly based on uh, student development or strictly based on breaking that cycle that where we uh, kind of dominate the classroom is it kind of like that no uh, it doesn't have to be uh, like that um, so we presented it the the cycle to you so that you know where we are and why are we doing this and why are the activities like that um, so as for the final um, final project, uh, so we can also tackle like other issues. Um, we, we can tackle other issues that are relevant to our communities. So it's like, um, you know, like we can be more like creative um, in, in like creating. <laughs> we can be more creative in um, creating the projects, but also like targeting the um, targeting the 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 uh, concepts that are included in our syllabus because we have a curriculum, right? So yes, yeah. So it can be uh, it's up to you. Uh, it can be like not student development, but it can be um, it can be like uh, an issue that is independent of your of your students or of your class but it can also yes i was wondering that actually because uh, i saw this lecture that uh, was shared on uh, covid-19 group where uh, it was about positive discourse analysis and uh, there was this poster about quit for quit for you quit for two so it was about uh, encouraging pregnant women to quit smoking mm -hmm. and uh, the positive discourse analysis was about that how what sort of language was used how the five senses were used to um, uh, to uh, get that to create that impression on the poster and to make it more credible to make it uh, more credible to the community where they live uh, so that's why i was actually asking the question that uh, is is can it be something like that because that actually intrigued me a lot um, that made that actually uh, showed me a different side uh, of language using language for, for the community outside of the classroom uh, yeah. frankly speaking yeah yeah um yes uh, definitely and and the reason the reason why they um actually that that material uh comes from the subject called language society and power so language society and power is basically um a subject that um that deals with like how language um you know how language plays role in the society and how it creates power and something like that and in order uh so so it's not designed in in a way that you know, Amar is discussing like uh, all these social linguistics, what is social linguistics and what is power and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So the students have their final output, and in their final output, they need um, to know about language. So so uh, that's Amar's class. So Amar is still like targeting those concepts about language and how does really language work in the society like for example if you are uh how will your language be if you are giving information for pregnant women or for indigenous people to stop smoking so how does mm -hmm. how does language change and then how about if you are talking to academics you know your, your language changes and how does language play a role and how does it change people's behavior? You know, and I guess we're seeing this right now a lot uh, during this pandemic. I think we are seeing the effect of language, the impact of language on us, frankly speaking. Right now, I was watching a bit of news on different news portals. And uh, frankly speaking, the heading of those news, uh, they can make you actually feel quite scared or quite encouraged. I mean, to both can happen. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like the the final project is the, the the big project, but 
it the all the knowledge that is in it is about linguistics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so he is still like targeting all the the things in the syllable uh, syllabus. And then there's a final project, which is a project that is really worthwhile for the community. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, so it's 5.30 and um, I, unfortunately, I'm going to say goodbye and I'm going to say thank you too. Uh, thank you very much for listening.